Showtime! Welcome to the very, very first weekly wrestling ramble by the Jabba Jabba Podcast. I am Kevin Wells, as always, and joined today, the new co-host of Weekly we- Weekly Wrestling Ramble, Todd Forrest. Todd, I don't suppose you wanted a, an alias, Jordan goes as J-Mac. He's yeah. happy to stay as uh, Todd. I'm happy as Todd. Yeah. As Todd. HB Todd. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll establish that in this episode for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so this... this new venture is basically uh, a side note to the Jibber Jabber podcast that's the wrestling section of what we are and um, this will always be a, a podcast with Todd and I you will occasionally see J-Mac jumping in and out when uh, when there's a bit of wrestling to talk about because J- J-Mac kind of he kind of dabbles his toe in wrestling a little bit I think if it interests him he'll jump on if not you'll be you'll be left with us too and um, it'll, it'll okay, basically just be Week, like what it says, weekly wrestling ramble. We'll chat about that week in wrestling, but we're also going to spice it up with some salt and pepper, right, Todd? I, th- I think we, we, Jay, I think what it is, he's seen us together. He sees how we speak about wrestling. It's almost like speaking in code, and mm-hmm. hopefully that comes across. And I think he's he's a guy who's never watched wrestling in his life before, mm-hmm. but now he's starting to see elements of it, and he's, he's interested. So hopefully we can do the same on this show for a lot of you, even if you are non-believers at this minute. <laughs> non-believers. That's exactly <laughs> what they are. They're, they're non-believers, and I think... I think even this show will be great for, for Jordan, for J-Mac, because we'll be able to make a wrestling fan out of him. Um, so sure. as, as the day that we record here, it's the 27th of December. Um, you guys are going to hear this on the 1st, so you guys, ha- Happy New Year. Um, yes. But the, the previous year, 2020, has kind of been the shittest year for a long time that we can remember, and not to mention for many reasons, but one being... The passing of Brody Lee, which is like yeah. kind of came out in nowhere. I yeah, mean, it's yeah, it's really strange. I mean, it's uh, the day of recording. This has actually happened first thing this morning. Um, mm-hmm. I I didn't know anything about it. Of course, I got your message, and then I was like, "Oh my word!" Um, he'd been off television. Um, actually, it's crazy because I read it and it, it said that actually his last match was in July, and I was like, "Christ, that's been a very quick six months." Mm-hmm. But um, we knew something was up. I just thought he was injured or maybe he was getting some time off. Um, yeah. But then y- y- you read something like that and you just go crikey. And I suppose it puts this whole year into perspective. Um, yeah. There's a lot. A lot of people have lost uh, loved ones across this year and. And it's not just, um, you know, it's not natural causes. It's not part of the plan, unfortunately. This guy was 41, uh, certainly not <laughs> not unfit. I mean, he was a wrestler for crying out loud. Um, yeah. Leaves behind you know, yeah, family and two kids. It's, it's, it's just really, really sad that someone someone's lost his life, but as well, he had so much more to give to the wrestling industry. Do you know what I think? I think we, we, we haven't really even seen the best of him yet. And I know that yep. that was something that, that there was a passion of his to kind of show that because that's why he left WWE yeah. to pursue that and to kind of to kind of have it cut off before he even got a, really got the chance to get going. That's Absolutely, cool. I mean, he, he came into AEW as quite a big deal. I mean, he came in as the exalted. Everybody thought the exalted one was going to be Matt Hardy, but no, they trusted mm-hmm. him to take the reins and make that stable something. Now, don't get me wrong, he, he probably didn't get off to the best of starts, but. He realised that and he, he was evolving that character and he was getting to the point where he was actually, you know, figuring this out. And then, of course, everything's transpired and we've lost um, we've lost a, a guy who's 41 years old but still had a, the best years in front of him, you would argue. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's, do you know, he reminded me of uh, Bruiser Brody. Oh, Again, another yeah. person who died fairly young. Obviously, the circumstances were different. Um, as, as, as we... We know right now the the circumstances surrounding Brody Lee's death was something to do with his lungs, but non COVID related, according to his wife. Uh, there's been a a, a a massive outpouring of love and you know grief from the wrestling community. WWE acknowledging, obviously. I mean, it's one thing to be like, right, he's no longer with WWE. Maybe some bur- uh, bridges were burned, but at the end of the day, he's a human being and he had a lot of family and friends. I say yeah. family, but you know, friends kind of just like family. If you've got the network, they've actually put up a. Uh, Luke Harper, as he was known in WWE mm-hmm. Network, special up of his best matches. Um, I know there was one um, 
where I think it was, I, I'm not 100% sure, I think it was maybe the Wyatt family versus the Shield. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not quite sure. I'll be honest, I'm not up to date with WWE from that time period. But it's, if you've got a network and if you want to see some of his work, it's there, of course, CAW. Um, I've seen it, there's a lot of outgoing. Chris Jericho says that he's starting to do a lot of his best work in AEW. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you could, you, of course, I don't, don't really know if there's a place you can watch that. But certainly a lot to go back to. It was a cracking big man wrestler. And it's um, an awful shame that he's going to join a list of a lot of others like him before who, unfortunately, in this industry, for some reason, have been taken from us far too early. Yeah, it's, it's a real shame. But, you know, all we can kind of do is just keep moving forward and uh you know just kind of remember his touch on the the wrestling industry he was a, he was a great big man he was a fast kind of agile uh, and from what everybody says about him he was a he was a, a great person so just gonna have to and it's, it's a shame we have to kind of start this series off on such <laughs> yeah, a, it's such a, a sour note. note but it yeah. would be it'd be quite hard not to kind of acknowledge that that and uh, dan hodge actually died on the same day um, oh, wow. he he obviously was a lot older um, so yeah. it's not kind of making yeah. the news but it's been Never quite a, a shitty end of the year for yeah he, and, and Pat Patterson died maybe just over a couple of weeks ago as well mm. um, we were just kind of rallying after that um, another I mean, massively influential it's been a it's been a really bad way bad year for wrestling in many ways it's been a bad year for everybody but um, absolutely what you say is completely true we've lost a big uh, big big character in the wrestling industry mm. and a even better person behind the scenes from what it appears to be. Yeah, the next episode of AEW should be really interesting because I don't think they've had to deal with that publicly yet. So it'll yeah. be the first time to see how they kind of deal with it. I would imagine they'll have the the uh, Brody Lee armbands and the tribute to Bell and whatnot. So. Well, it's going to be interesting, isn't it? I mean, we'll talk about um, AEW when we do our weekly roundup. Um, so I've, I mean, it's going to leave a lot of question marks going forward as we'll, as we'll speak about, but... Uh, absolutely, I think you're right. I think the next ep- episodes will be a, a Dynamite is Brody yeah. type episode. For sure. Speaking of the next episode of Dynamite, let's talk about the previous episode of Dynamite. So we'll kind of start us off with <laughs> AEW and move over to WWE. I mean, those are kind of the two main topics that we'd cover unless there's something else noteworthy going on in wrestling. And by the way, I think I think one of the hardest things to do right now in any wrestling company is be, you know, be current and kind of have something worth talking about while COVID is not a thing. So I think the only for this point in time right now, I think the only things we can really talk about is AEW and WWE because they're the only guys really oh, going yeah. to bat. So we'll start off with the AEW. Um, I'll, I'll maybe even kick this off. So sure. this week in AEW, as I was watching this week's episode, right, and I think the pardon me, the main event was Hakira Shida, Hakira yeah. Hakira Shida, right. One thing I'm just going to straight say straight up, that's not Asuka. No. <laughs> right. And I think, see for no. AEW, see something that kind of bothers me because AEW, obviously, I, I believe in AEW and I'd like to see them succeed. And there's a lot Sorry. of good in AEW, but there's a lot of that early, like, you know, when TNA kind of started just ripping off everything WWE done. Yes. I think there's there's elements of that. And that woman comes out pretty much like uh, Asuka. And the issue with that is there's already an Asuka. You're not going to be better at Asuka no. No. than being Asuka. So. Change it up. I think I think that woman's really talented. I think she just should change it up and try and differentiate herself completely from Asuka. And you know what? As well, she's not. That's she's not even the only one that does that. There are there are wrestlers in AEW that are currently trying to be wrestlers in WWE or vice versa. And yes. it just kind of makes you go, "What the street profits?" I mean, <laughs> profits <laughs> AEW or WWE? I can't even tell. What one of the street profits? Street profits are WWE. It's right. um, private party. Right. Are they AEW. not the same thing? They are practically, yeah. They are. Like, it's very difficult to tell them apart. Um, they're both just uh, two African American tag teams who just seem to have the same type of party all night gimmick and kind of bounce around around. <laughs> it's really hard to kind of tell them apart, and that these are the kind of things that I kind of thought to note while I'm watching it that really puts me off. I'm just like, right, I don't, I don't care. It's a stupid, yeah. and and it's a shame that something as simple as that is is enough to turn me off, but it does. It really I mean. Does. You, you touched upon the women's division in AEW. I mean, I, th- I think if uh, AEW has been running for o- over a year now, um, and this has been the first proper 2020, unfortunately, for them has been <laughs> their first, uh, you know, end-to-end year that they've actually started on television. And there's been highs and there's been lows, but their women's division certainly is one of the massive improvements they could make um, from their first year and a half. Mm-hmm. Um, 
my personal opinion, I think Nyla Rose has been um, booked terribly. I feel that she should have been the inaugural AEW Women's Champion and should have held the belt and made it credible for over a year, but that's not happened. We've actually you know what three. I like about Nyla Rose, and I thought would have been really yeah. interesting, right? As she, she she's a, a trans a transsexual. <laughs> <laughs> a trans- transgender trans- right, right. <laughs> <laughs> that's a transsexual <laughs> yes oh, yes you did well just... really <laughs> <laughs> right so she used to be a guy play on that absolutely play on that right because i know that there was a lot of uh people up in arms you know she shouldn't be in it because she was built like a man well wait a minute it's wrestling yes does, does they really count right absolutely so i think they should have absolutely played on that like she, they should have made her an absolute tank unbeatable exactly for like two years rusev like original rusev run kind of unbeatable. Right? <laughs> she that should would've... be the woman's brock lesnar <laughs> right in that absolutely. company i mean she technically had balls she had <laughs> balls right i mean come on right no oh, disrespect yeah. to her whatsoever like but that if that wasn't enough to run with yeah uh, it, it's, it's certainly something to do improvement. I know that Kenny Omega uh, takes a lot of creative control of the women's division, allegedly, and he likes his Japanese wrestlers. That's why the um, two of the women's female champions have both been Japanese. Forgive me if I've got that wrong, but we've had Riho, and then we've got Hakara Shida, who's current champion. Mm-hmm. But we'll see how that progresses. Um, talking about AEW, um, Kev, there's a storyline going on right now. I feel like I've watched the same segment for the last three weeks where, with the introduction of Sting. Uh, Sting mm-hmm. came to AEW a couple of weeks ago and it was really cool. He came into the ring. He st- stared down Cody Rhodes because, of course, he fucking did. Um, and he stared down Darby Allen because, of course, he fucking did. And I feel like Sting's only just been doing that for the last couple of weeks. Comes out to the ring, says a few things, sometimes doesn't say a few things before it gets interrupted by Taz and his cronies. I feel like I've watched the same segment over and over again. Mm-hmm. And uh, this week was no different. Uh, but instead, Sting came to the ring with Tony Schiavone, who seemed Tony Schiavone, Tony Schiavone. I don't know how you're supposed to say it. That's right, Tony Schiavone. Um, yeah. Did you know that they um they were both in WCW and uh, in TNT in the nineties? Did you know that, Kevin? I did I was not very know much that. Aware. I was aware before Sting returned to AEW. I mean, I oh, I, I, I I did not know that because you know they've not been knocking absolute fucking pan out of it. <laughs> um, so so for somebody like me who never watched a lot of WCW in the nineties, it's really nice to be reminded every single fucking week. <laughs> that Tony Schiavone was the WCW commentator back in the 90s when Sting was... Yeah. Anyway, I, I, for those who are not picking up on my facetiousness, I do apologise, but <laughs> I'm being facetious as hell. So yeah, Sting came out, he did a Dusty Rhodes impression, because, well, of course he fucking did. It's, yeah, um, yeah. it's his son's company. It was quite a good impression, to be fair, but then, of course, Taz and his um, bunch of jobbers came out. Um, <laughs> uh, well, they are. I think, <laughs> they are jobbers, you know what? Man. You know what? One of them shouldn't be. I think um, I think Brian Cage. There's a lot of potential in him. Was oh, it Ricky? Ricky, what's his face? Ricky Starks. Right. I think there's there's something to him. I think there's a uh, again uh, another year or two. Uh, Brian Cage for sure. But the thing about Brian Cage, he's a, he's got that thing that I like to class as the the Bobby Lashley syndrome. There's something about him that's very like ugh, he's. He's intimidating, but his face, if you shave off those wee sideburns, says that his mum packs his packed lunch, right? right? You know his mum packs his packed lunch, and you know he's going to be annoyed if she's put butter on it when, they, when he asks for no butter, right? There's something about him that's very much like that. Um, something that Brock Lesnar doesn't possess. When you look at Brock Lesnar, it's sheer intensity. Doesn't oh, yeah. matter what he's doing, right? You just don't even want to fuck with him. Yes. Brian Cage doesn't possess that, unfortunately. I, I, I can understand where you're coming from. I personally feel that when he first came in, um, he was he should have been booked as a monster. The problem was, um, I was going to call him Ambrose, but Moxley held the title at the time, and he was holding on to quite a bit of a run, so it felt like when he came in, he couldn't beat him, but I would have personally made the choice for Cage to run right over him, because I'm kind of the idea, if you're going to bring in a monster, build him big and give him longevity, but they've had several chances to do this, AEW, and have yeah. not done it once. Uh, I mean, Brody Lee, we mentioned him earlier in the show. He should have been the first one. Um, the second one, who's completely perplexing me at the minute, is Lance Archer. Um, mm. He should have been booked as a monster. 
and uh, Luke Cage was the third botched attempt, in my opinion. And Ryan, but, Ryan Cage. <laughs> but, 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 <laughs> Luke Cage, that's a Luke Cage. <laughs> uh, I'm not the first, I'm not the last. Brian Cage. <laughs> happens always. Uh, I know. Do you so know, I think the issue is as well, is they've got too many, quote-unquote, big guys in AEW. <sighs> too yeah, many guys and... to go through. Right? But, but here's the thing. Do you think maybe? Do you think maybe that's why they're like Miro? We already have these big root <sighs> motherfuckers. So why don't you come in as someone wearing a a pink <laughs> and start playing arcade games oh, and act like a right bitch? Don't get me started, man. I mean, what's he uh, done yet in AEW that's really notable? Well, he's he seems to have got really angry a few times about people, you know switching off his arcade machines or <laughs> fucking up his playstations <laughs> see the minute i mean I'll, I'll i am a big I, i've been a big supporter of orange cassidy um during especially during especially when pre-covid when he had the audiences behind him he was absolutely over he still is very over but the audience were kind of like half the, the appeal to orange cassidy it's kind of what made him and behind the covid curtain i really don't think that's worked for me mm-hmm. so seeing him like, up against Miro really should be a total mismatch and the fact that isn't tells me that everything Miro has done so far regarding his creative is wrong because him and Orange Cassidy and the ring should be the biggest mismatch on the whole show and to go back to the segment we're speaking about talking about mismatches in the segment where Sting where Sting clearly being touted as a mouthpiece for uh, right, Ke- Kevin said this to me before the show and it absolutely destroyed me. <laughs> Everybody's favourite trolley collector, Darby <laughs> Allen. <laughs> <laughs> he is though, right? Is he not just the guy that you see at Walmart, Asda, right, Tesco? He's the guy that goes and gets the trolleys that people leave, right? Put Thanks, a wee mate, high yeah. on him. That's I'll him. take that for you. <laughs> That's him. And no disrespect to him whatsoever. I think, I think what's happening is that they're kind of putting a rocket under his ass right now when I don't think it's time really for him. It's not, I, I, I don't think it's time. Yeah, I mean, I get it. He's, 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 I get why people or younger people would find him cool. He's got the face paint. He rides a skateboard. He's got that quite a good entrance theme, that ding, 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 ding. Mm. I, 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 I get it. Annoys me. Do you know what annoys I, me about that? Is the fact that his pals are getting the shit kicked out of them in the ring, right? Yeah. And, and his running has his music with him skating to the ring. Get to uh, the I know. Right, but, see if you're in a bar and your pal's getting glassed. Are you going to be like, wait a minute, cue my fucking song, wait till I grab my skateboard? No, you're going to run in there and I can't. Uh, I, I, I com- because of the age we are, I completely agree with you, but I can see somebody who's 14, 15 year old, that's who, who they are appealing with, uh, appealing to with Darby Allen, they're going to see it as edgy and cool. So I, I get it. I think it's a bit shit, but <laughs> um, I basically announced in this segment that Darby Allen's facing Luke Cage on the 6th of January. Luke Cage. <laughs> Luke Cage, fuck me, man. That's going to become a running top. <laughs> Brian Cage, the machine Brian Cage. <laughs> yeah. They're facing each other for the TNT Championship. And you know that Darby's not going to lose it. So I'm, there's got to be shenanigans to go down there because see if Darby beats him clean, that guy's finished as well, far see, as I'm ah, Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But here's something for you. Realistically, right, who could Darby Allen, if you pick anybody in the AEW roster, just by sizing them up, doing that whole face off in the ring, mm-hmm. who could Darby Allen kick the shit out of? To be fair, probably I would say... Orange Cassidy, um, maybe. Pro- well, this is say probably the book in the minute probably would. Cody, not even Cody, who's actually for wrestling terms is actually on the smaller side, <laughs> still completely <laughs> outsizes him. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I don't buy him question, at all. Right? Where would where would he be if he was working for Vince? He would be on that two hundred five live. Him and along with there you go, Sammy Guevara. I'm not. I feel like I've not seen a lot of Sammy lately. He, mm-hmm. in my opinion, out of those two, they've had some cracking matches. Actually, to be fair to them, when they've gone against each other, so they're being kind of touted. There was those two in Jungle Boy were kind of being touted as AEW's like future main eventers. But um, for me, Sammy's got the most potential. A lot of them. But you're right. If they were in WWE, they would be um, in two or five live, or they would be one of the background dancers for somebody like an, an Adam Page or a Brodus Clay type thing. That's where Sammy and that's where Darby would be at the minute. So I suppose you can look at it that way. AEW are giving the, the much smaller guys a chance. But for me with Darby Allen, he's going to have Sting um, to kind of legit, legitimise him. But um, Why? There are <sighs> other people that need it right now that could do with that. I, 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 I don't know. I feel, I feel like um, Darby Allen's still got a lot 
a lot of a lot of ways to go before I he's legitimate in my eyes or um yeah legitimate and we use that word. He's getting the Roman Reigns treatment right now and it'll backfire. Well, the thing is, he seems to be quite popular, which I d- cannot understand. I mean, from well, people so I've was Roman, and then they overexposed him, and then and then it became very clear that he was the company guy, that the one they wanted. And when the fans realise that, it turns. Oh, right. Well, let's 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 get this first. He wasn't on the show this week, but uh, Darby Allen is not <laughs> the chosen one in regards to AW. It's quite clear. Well, the chosen they did. one is. <laughs> yeah, well, chosen <laughs> by himself. <laughs> <laughs> Did um did you realise though um that they did make a big point about you know Darby Allen being the first uh, wrestler in the uh, AEW to actually win a title the first homegrown that didn't come from any other company. No, uh, to be honest, uh, I think they're kind of hanging their hat on that. To be, uh, and fair play, if they want to legitimise their own people, I, I totally understand that. Just keep but... him in his lane though. Didn't he have him taking out Brian Cage? You don't want to you, you don't want to push him too soon. I feel I think me and you on the same page. I think he's been pushed to the moon too soon. It's not to say that he's um, particularly bad. He's certainly not offensive. He's just not at that level yet, and I don't buy it. Speaking so. of being being on the same page, why isn't fucking Hangman Adam Page getting that treatment? Oh man, um, this this kind of leads me onto another thing at the minute. Um, he's kind of got this um, whole thing going on with the Dark Order, and um, same same way that there was a match with Dustin Rhodes where. Um, Oh, by, by the way, did you also know Dustin Rhodes had a gimmick in WCW in the nineties where he was called Seven? Yeah. Do you know? Did you know that they dressed me up like fucking Uncle Fester because <laughs> they wanted me to be the Undertaker? <laughs> yeah, they'd be making a big, they'd be making a big deal. Of it. And to be fair, sometimes that works, but Mate, they really just do boot the arse at it, man. That's one thing again, right? There's a few people in AEW where I'm like, I expected so much better of you, and Dustin Dustin Rhodes is is a prime example of that. Right? Why? Why are we not seeing the the Dustin Rhodes that we always knew was there in WWE? To be fair, I actually um, probably going to be quite controversial. I expected to see less of him. I was expecting him to be. Um, he had his match with Cody at the Double or Nothing, which was great. It seemed like it was a perfect time for him, maybe to kind of go. You know what? Um, that's my time to kind of pull back a little bit and maybe do some more work behind the scenes. And I thought it would be the case. But for me, he kind of shows up a little bit too often. I think he should be one of those guys that wrestles more as a special event, almost like your, maybe it's maybe a difficult comparison, but like a Triple H, um, you know, mm-hmm. a guy who they maybe pull out one, you know, for the big, you know, just a big event, you know. Um, that makes sense, yeah. Rather than just oversaturating with weekly Thing matches is, though, and I've dynamite. I've really, really loved Dustin. He's a good hand. I've he's, always he's loved him, and I've always known there's more to him. I just, I'm really disappointed that I didn't get to see that. So, I mean, we've not yet got to see it. Here's another thing that gets me as well, right? Brian Pillman Jr., the the son of Brian Pillman. What <laughs> Who is fuck? like the double. He's like the double right. of Brian Pillman as well. And, and, and here's another thing as well. Billy Gunn's son, Austin Gunn, right? At this point, all he is is a Judas backing singer. <laughs> because the there's only thing you like see of him, the only... Let's start taking the, the up-and-coming wrestlers out of the audience, right? Because all we're seeing right now is them fucking singing to Judas, right? And it looks yeah. fucking stupid. To be fair, when, it first, when they first did it, it was good because it, before it was when WWE didn't have the Thunderdome and mm-hmm. AEW. It, we, we just sat through the, the silent WrestleMania and it, it, it's, it was a better alternative. Mm-hmm. But I, now that they've got the crowds back in, um, at least a small margin of the crowd. They don't need that anymore. I completely agree with you. Uh, I don't know if it's just to make them look busy around the sides. But... Let it let that be the audience. Give the yeah. audience those seats. We don't need to see wrestlers sitting there, you know, with bandanas around their head singing like children. Yeah. Just, yeah. Let's remember it, what we're trying what they're trying to achieve here, you know? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's kinda it's difficult to take seriously when you've been watching a guy who's been singing around the ring every week to Judas and then coming out and actually trying they did it with that um Shook D. Uh, with Pineapple Pete. He's an independent wrestler, uh, Sugar Duncanton, as I sometimes refer to. He's done the Reckless Intent, stuff like that. All right. But he, he, had a, he had a feud against Chris Jericho, I say a feud. He, he was um, basically he was wearing a pineapple shirt in the audience, and everybody was catching his eye and going, hey, look at this guy, he's, called, uh, he's got Pineapple Pete, because Chris Jericho called him Pineapple Pete, mm-hmm. and he ended up having a match on Dynamite against Chris Jericho. Oh. He got beat, but, you know... <laughs> It was a, a shining moment for him. So it was quite difficult to take that as credible, though. Like, oh, he was singing Judas a couple of weeks back, and now here he is. Mm. He's actually. Have you noticed as well? <laughs> Sorry, um, Chris Jericho keeps. Uh, a lot of people are giving Chris Jericho flack for his shape. 
Are you kidding me on? The guy's right. like he's in excellent shape for a man of his age. Right, well, <laughs> and then what they do though is they then, when someone says that comment you just said, which I completely validate, right? Then someone then holds up pictures of Triple H and Edge who are in much, much greater shape at the same age, right? And they're like, for fuck's sake, Jericho. I think first off, no one knows Jericho's schedule. No one knows what it is that he's at. I think they should lay the fuck off. That... Right. That's Jericho that we've got now. This is an evolution of Jericho. His his next evolution may not be in the same shape. Correct. This evolution of Jericho, he's in that shape. Take it for what it is. I think it's also he's a man of many hats. Mm-hmm. He's he fronts a rock band, right? Mm-hmm. He has a podcast where he is extremely consistent with putting out episodes every week, and you know how much work that takes, right? Hell yeah. He is he's on weekly television where he's getting mm-hmm. involved in the creative process. He's got so many other things going on. Plus, that's a guy who, whenever I see him now, I'm like, that is a man who's enjoying his life. He mm-hmm. is, he's living it up. He does not give a care about uh, what shape he's in. He's just living it up. He's drinking as much as he likes. He's partying. Um, like, see, they, they, they did the, um, the Las Vegas skit with him in the inner circle. We'll not maybe touching them too much because they've not really got a lot going at the minute. Mm. Um but yeah, that was when they went to Vegas. I was like, "There's no way that they've not had a can blow out there." Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Jericho looked legitimately like steaming in a lot of the <laughs> in a lot of those vignettes. But hmm. yeah, I think people are wrong to, to, as you say. I think it's all kind of part of his gimmick. Um, plus, I, I really don't think he gives a shit at this point. Um, no, and, and neither should. I mean, no. he's Chris Jericho. You know, I mean, who, who's got the right to say anything? He's um, if most wrestling fans are honest, um, whether they're whether they've got allegiances to WWE or AW or not, I think most people would recognise Jericho at least on the top ten um, of their all-time lists. Mm-hmm. Maybe not everybody, but I think the fair majority would agree that he's worthy of being spoken in that type of company. So absolutely, so he gets a pass for no matter what he does. Absolutely, he's at that point he's earned it, man. Uh-huh. He, he's, Absolutely. That's why when he's getting criticised a lot by the likes of Jim Cornette for the stuff he's pulling in the AW, but you know what? He doesn't care, and to be honest, we should kind of give him his... He wants to do what he wants to do. Let him do it. He's, yeah. he's earned it, man. For sure. Um, I'm going to kind of touch on MJF, who for me oh, yeah. has been like the breakout from AW from everywhere. Recently, <coughs> I, I'm going to say I, I don't like the the MGF with the inner circle stuff. I think it makes him... MGF was legitimately a heel, and now I feel he's very mizzy. Right? Yeah, it's he's not, very it's mizzy now. I don't think it has. I don't think it's done anybody any favours. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll talk about... Um, we'll talk, I'll talk about him a little bit more because he's in, he's in, when we talk about our top fives, I've got a top five of this year. Um, one segment, which I want to include in there. But I, I totally agree with you. I don't feel he needed the whole inner circle rub. I felt like the guy Santana Ortiz and certainly Sammy Guevara, who feels benefited most of it, and mm-hmm. uh, Jake Hager to an extent, they've benefited from that rub. But with with um, MGF, it was quite clear he didn't need that. And I think this is more to progress the storyline to the eventual breakup of um, the, um, the inner circle. But who knows when that's going to be. Personally, I would have preferred the breakup to just be between Sammy and Jericho to legitimise him, but that's not Again, Sammy's still very... Yeah, but it would have been further down the road. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I felt I felt there was still a lot of mileage in the inner circle as it, what it was, and I think they felt that way too, but I honestly don't know where this is going at the minute. Um, one, of the, one of the last things I'll say about um, <clears throat> my perception of this week in wrestling with AEW uh, is this the thing I see every week on AEW? I mean, this week's episode didn't didn't really have a lot of substance to it. I thought they're just kind of matches, oh, right? It was pre-taped as well, so I think it was that. So, but um, one thing I I really dislike, uh, not personally, but I don't like Young Buck matches. No. And any any matches that that have four hundred fucking flips, right? I sat watching the Young Bucks episode, right? Uh, the the Young Bucks, the Young Bucks. <laughs> Bucks. The young bucks. I sat young with, fucks. <laughs> yeah, they were wrestling. Uh, who? Who's those new guys? The guy that uh, got like green trunks. I'm still remembering names for new guys. I'm I'm a new kind of newcomer to the. Mm-hmm. It was the week, not not just there, but the week before. And my wife was sitting there, and I goes, "Watch this." I says, "This genuinely looked like they're trying to fucking hurt each other." And no, it was. Mm-hmm. You could see the two guys that were not the young bucks waiting, waiting to catch them. Right, right, and they're doing fuck. They're fucking cheerleaders, man. 
nothing, <laughs> nothing about that goes like I, I don't watch that and go oh, I'd hate to try and wrestle with those guys because I'll get my ass kicked no yeah. I'm just like the, these guys are like fucking gymnastics it's not wrestling I mean I, I know you've got a lot to say in them and I do too and I have a lot to say about their pal Cody because I feel they all have a lot of um, similar faults when it comes to um, their egos at least the way it's coming across um, I don't want to go on it too much because I know we're t- we've spoken quite a lot about AEW but We'll, we'll have plenty of episodes to speak about the Young Bucks and Cody Rhodes. And also, we mentioned Ham Man and Page, not touched upon him. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel his booking at the minute is a bit questionable, but with now knowing what we know regarding Brody Lee's passing, it might make a little more sense the fact he's now starting to be mm. teased with the Dark Order. I don't know. We'll, we'll wait and see. See, if I'm honest, I've, I've never really liked the Dark Order. I think what Brody mm. Lee had got going from his class. Do you know what I don't like? Right, you had Brody Lee, a very polarizing figure. I thought, all oh, right, cool. See his Dark Order d- minions and stuff. See the fact they're wearing fucking stupid face masks that look like sharks and stuff. Totally just yeah. No. Uh, t- to be if you, if you asked me, and people might disagree with this, I feel that I feel now that we know what we know. I think the right thing to do um, would be a, yeah. I think it would be. I think it would be to come out the next episode and say, you know what, we're nothing without our exalted one. Well disband the dark order is what it was it'll be that or just like you know yeah. well Brody lee is no more right mm. so wow whatever he had over us is gone you know what i mean <sighs> I, I don't think they'll do that i don't think they'll have i i, I don't think they'll do that because some i don't think people would see that um i, I don't know, if, I don't know. If, if i was Brody lee i'd be like use this shit in an angle i know i know but I'd, we live in a very offended world right now kevin yeah so. Yeah, yeah, I do. I do think that there, there shouldn't be a dark order anymore. I, I I agree with that. I think we're both agreed on that. I think the dark we'll order uh, was close to running its course anyway. I think everybody was waiting to see what happened if when Brody was going to come back, but of course that's not going to happen now. So I think it's, it's really gotten. It really is. Yeah, it's shocking. It's, it's terrible mm. news. So really bad. So we'll move on to WWE now. Yeah. Um, WWE. I mean, I took I took some notes. Uh, <laughs> I had Drew. to as well. <laughs> Drew McIntyre. <laughs> Yes. Right. Fucking best work of his career. The boy done well. The boy done well. Hometown boy. Yeah. Do you know what's funny is <laughs> that his last ever, his last ever indie wrestling match before he initially went to WWE, I can see from my house the venue they done it in. Right. Yeah. Which which is a, a wee reminder, and the fact that and this is another thing, right? So J Mac, you know J Mac, Jabber Jabber J Mac, is the same age as Drew. <laughs> right? I'm like fucking look at what you can achieve, man. Um, so I did you thought, watch his broken skull session? That's awesome. Exactly, what I was going to say yeah, oh, that's yeah. Awesome. And I was relating to a lot of it because I've followed. We've followed Drew from from the start. We've always been rooting for him as he's our fellow Scotsman. Worked in the same company as we actually did. You know what I mean? I as we did, you did. Well, you were there. We done. Stuff. I, I, I was there in the beginning before I got got a dodge. <laughs> <laughs> I went, this is not for me. This is this is pain, man. <laughs> anyway. But it was, it was, it's great to see him finally get there. Oh, it's fantastic. Now that you incorporate his full story in that, I think, you know, I just hope that it's not a one and done. I hope that they keep him in the main event picture and that he continues to kind of do what he's been doing. I had the same question, Marks, but see, after if you've not listened to his um, Broken Skull session with, with Steve Austin, it's about an hour and a half long, and it's one of the best hour and a half you'll have this year. Um I really liked it because it's shown how much he'd grown, not just as a wrestler, but as a person. Mm-hmm. He freely admits that he was not ready first time round. Um, but, you know, he's came back, he's reinvented himself, and now he's WWE champion. And I honestly see the way he was speaking. Um, I was like, actually, you will be there. If you believe it and you continue what you say you, you're going to continue to do, then you'll be there for many years to come. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's certainly knocking at the park at the minute. I think you may have agreed that the sword and the kilt's a bit overkill. He probably would admit that himself, but he is working for an American company with an American audience, and they they love all that. Mm-hmm. They have heart shite. Yeah. Um, so I think it's very caricature of who he is. You know, yeah. as Scotsmen yeah. aren't all ginger with big beards called Hamish that eat haggish neeps and tatties with fucking swordsmen. And we all don't talk like this. We don't exactly. all speak like that, Seamus. <laughs> let me tell you. Yeah. Um, by the way, Big E, uh, I yeah, can and see, Cornell champion. Yeah. I can see the climb beginning for Big E. Um, by the way, here's a question I'm going to ask yeah. you: Do you think Big E is the breakout star of 
the new day? Depends what industry you're speaking about. Well, as as he, the like so. What I mean probably, by that is with Xavier Woods, he could certainly break into another. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't just go there. Yeah. Uh, gaming, gaming. I think Xavier Woods has. Out in the <laughs> oh yes, of course, in gaming, <laughs> absolutely. Um, to be honest with you, I'm going to say yes because um, I know people will sit there and go, "Ah, oh, but Kofi," and I'm like, "Nah, sorry, Kofi, um, great, great wrestler." I love Kofi, talented guy, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah, he's never seen. He's never been a top level guy to me, Kofi. Even when mm. we went for the whole Kofi Mania thing, I was like, "I'm great." I'm glad he was getting the mat moment there, but I knew it was only going to be temporary. He's not the type of guy they want. But Big E has got potential. Um, I feel um, as long as he's not the character that he was in the New Day all the time. That's true, but I, I, I don't that. think he's needs to evolve. The thing about Big E of, of what I've kind of noticed is that he needs people to he doesn't come he, he doesn't come out of his shell uh, it doesn't come out of his shell on his own so if he's a single wrestler you're not going to get the great promos i think he's a collaborator and not someone that does it on his own i think as in work as in ring work is going to be great i think you yeah. get good matches out of him but i don't think you're going to get the run at him that, that everybody's expecting i just don't see it well, 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 to be honest, it's one of those question mark ones for me because um, we'll have to wait and see what he's capable of. Mm-hmm. I'd love to see what, uh, I mean, I think we've seen a heel Big E before, but that was before he really kind of found his feet with the New Day. Yeah. Um, so uh, he's not a heel at the moment, but it, it's going to happen down the road and we'll, uh, that'll be the making or the break of them for me. But um, mm-hmm. we'll wait and see with that. I mean, there was, a, I, I, I went, I'll be honest, I didn't watch WWE live. I, I don't really watch the Raws or the Smackdowns, or especially, I've, I've not watched any NXT live at all. Uh, I'll certainly be making more of an effort to do so now that we're doing this. Um, I watch AEW every week, but um, I made an effort to kind of catch up with the segments and stuff like that. Um, so in SmackDown, I know that you've got um, the whole Roman reign stuff going on right now with Paul Heyman, and it seems that there seem to be building a feud with Daniel Bryan there. I think that's that's got potential. Daniel mm. Bryan's no Daniel Bryan's definitely not taking that title off Roman, so it's about no. disbelieving there. Mate, do you know def- what I love? Do you know what I love about yeah. Roman? Which, by the way, again, he's doing the best work he has ever done. Right, it's um, been his year. My right. opinion, yeah. Roman Reigns, I genuinely feel like nobody can beat him. Yeah, he's building that legitimacy. Mm-hmm. Um, worries me a little bit is uh, Goldberg's piping up, which we'll talk about. We'll talk about Goldberg soon, I'm sure. But um, he started to pipe up saying, "Oh, Roman Reigns, you're next." I'm gonna yeah. go. Yeah. Better know. Mania, me. come take him down, take, <laughs> a, take take his title, and then Roman gets it back at Mania. Fuck oh, off. Thank you. Do you know what would be even better if? Goldberg comes out and he's like, yeah, yeah. And everybody expects the whole Goldberg and fucking Roman just leathers him. <laughs> oh, how good would that be? I mean, see at the minute, right? Roman should, they're booking Roman perfectly at the minute. or um, But I, I agree with you. He needs to be unbeaten for a long time. He needs to hold that title past Mania. If they book, I know that the, the idea is they're going to book him long term with The Rock. To be honest, I'm, see Mania next year. If it's not in front of an audience, mm-hmm. Rock's got nothing going on, man. Rock's not filming any movies right now. Mm-hmm. Get him in, but get him beat. I'm sorry, he needs <laughs> to. Rock, if Rock beats Roman with the way he's being booked here, it's not the right decision. Um, I, I don't really know anybody who at the minute who's like that's a guy who needs to beat Roman. I don't know if he's mm-hmm. if that person even even Brock. yet. Even Brock. No, because it would be the same thing again. I mean, what would that do for Roman? I think Roman, if you built built him correctly, he's in a, a spot where whoever beats him. Could be a made guy themselves. I think. But, I think uh, Drew could beat him. Well, beat him. and uh, do you know what? That, how series. good was how good was that match? Best match I have seen in a long time. That is a the prime example of a match, that. right? That a clean. Well, I wouldn't say a clean. Even if it was clean, though, right? That is the greatest example a of a match where no one is hurt. Right. Yes. Yes. Nobody was, came out looking bad. No, it was fucking brilliant, and, and you're just like the fact that Drew lost. You know that Drew could take him. Right. I, I mean, I, I feel I mean, that match was good, but I feel that that should be a lot further down the road. I think they maybe should save that for a mania. I think they should be kind of kept a part of the moment. Mm-hmm. They're both doing a good job of representing their brands. I think SmackDown, uh, if I was to, it's not a criticism of Drew, I think Roman's probably doing a little bit of a better job than Drew is on that at the minute. Yeah. But, Do you, you know, know why? Do you know why? It's because I hate. think, they, right, because Drew's like, yes, I'm the greatest, the greatest good guy. Yeah, I'm going to. 
if, if you fuck up in this company, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be down your throat. See, when you turn Drew heel, he's going to take it up a notch yet again. I think Drew, Drew as a heel will be a better Drew than a face Drew. Face Drew is good, right? Yeah. But the intensity, everything will just, it'll, it'll go up. If you imagine Drew that cheats to win. Yeah. Oh man, I, I, I like. I mean, I, Drew is good. Drew's just good all around. I mean, maybe uh, I, for a minute, like, where I was like, is it, are we just saying that because we're Scottish? Because we speak to a lot of Scottish people, and they've just got a bad one to say about Drew. Of course, we yeah. don't. But I'm just trying to figure: is there anybody down south going, Drew's absolutely overrated? He's absolutely jock muck. No, nah, no, it's not happening. Everybody likes Drew. He's doing a good job. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the, uh, Daniel Bryan will get a good match or two out of Roman Reigns. Other than that, there's 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 no chance. Uh, it almost gauges my interest a little bit less because I'm like Daniel Bryan. I like Daniel Bryan, but he's he's not being Roman, is he? No, um, absolutely not. The, the Miz is kind of being booked with uh, the Miz and AJ Styles are kind of going with um, Drew McIntyre. I, mean, I could see AJ possibly beating Drew maybe sometime soon, but I'll be honest if I actually said I cared. Um, that's the problem. Think, WWE's uh, not got a lot going on for me at the moment. I think WWE are a bit wary of AJ Styles. Because they know that he's got his eyes on him. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, think, you think you've got a theory about AJ Styles. I mean, with the position WWE's in at the minute, there's, they're doing their legend show. And for me, that tells you everything you need to know. They're, but they're getting the lowest ratings. It's a combination of um, not booking people correctly. Um, mm. The crowd, is, see the Thunderdome? It's a good idea, but... I actually prefer the setup AEW's got at the moment. It's limited capacity, but even with just a small amount of fans, it makes such a difference because mm-hmm. it's legitimate. Um, the Thunderdome, just, it's still an empty arena, man, um, with a bunch of people going, like, like pretending to be mm-hmm. shocked. and Because like, they're not playing for the cameras, that's what people do. Um, yeah. So that's why I don't have a lot of interest in WWE at the moment. Um, the Fiend, what the it's happened there. Um, the Fiend's deed, apparently. But Alexa Bliss is telling us that he's not really deed because he's going to come back even scarier now. And, uh, he's, How he's, funny he's gonna... would it be if he came out and he's like, guys, they didn't really burn me. It was a dummy. <laughs> they, they burned a dummy. It wasn't me, you funny. <laughs> or he came back as a chip or something like that. <laughs> Reinvents himself as the chip. I don't know. He's going to come back with something. He's going to come back with a, like a, a lever face fit, like, or, um, you know, he's going to be like a Michael Myers type character. It doesn't matter. Jason, doesn't matter what you do. You can't beat the Fiend. He mm-hmm. dies, he comes back. He, uh, he dies, he comes back, and I still don't care. I'm sorry. Um, I like the idea of the character. My problem with it is Bray Wyatt himself. If you're going to play that mysterious character, see your social media. I know you love it and all that, but get it to fuck. Mm-hmm. It's the reason why Undertaker was so good at what he does for so many years. It was a mistake. It was this, the mystery of... We, we knew who the Undertaker was. We knew there was a guy behind it, but we knew next to fuck all about him. Mm-hmm. We didn't have him, Undertaker, posing with his kids in full fucking costume on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Here, I'm the fiend, and here's my wife, and here's my baby boy, it's, or baby girl that's been born. For me, I don't know, maybe it's a really modern age thing they need to have social media to they're allowed to do that blah 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 but for me if i was a wrestler in that position i would be a total recluse i would be no social media no nothing i would want my character to be the most yeah that's how i feel about the fiend uh, and i hate this harley quinn joker type thing i think it's fucking cliched as fuck and i've even no, i like i like alexibus but i've got no interest in it yeah. Sorry, ran over. <laughs> oh, no. So that kind of concludes our This Week in Wrestling. Make sure you guys check us out next week to hear our thoughts. I mean, we're total long-time wrestling fans. We've I've uh, watched wrestling from the golden age right through that of Tudera to now. Uh, same with Todd. Kinda, he's been more of a historian. Uh, <laughs> check, checking it out while uh, you kind of tuned in R- Ruthless Aggression era. I'd yeah, just... I mean, if, to put it straight, I mean, me and Kevin have known each other for a long time, probably going back to like 2003, I would say 17 years, um, 2003, 2004 around that time. Mm-hmm. And I knew wrestling when I first came in, I knew of it, um, but I, I didn't, as you say, ruthless aggression era, I mean, it's kind of where I came in. I knew about a bit about the Rock Austin years, Triple H, that type of stuff, but I never was fully into it like we would be now. It's mm-hmm. after I met Kevin and Kevin started telling me all these crazy, like 
the reason we're going to do a segment of the show, I don't think we're going to do it this week, but going forward, I, I want Kevin to, di- to dive in to the more unknown and weird aspects of wrestling because even when you think you know it all, you think you, oh, you've seen it all, especially when you've looked at it as much as far as I have, you still miss things. Mm-hmm. And you miss things that only people who were there watching at the time remember. Absolutely. And Kevin is that guy. Kevin is the guy who grew up watching it. His mum had tapes, a cupboard full of these VHS tapes. And the year was like 2018 or something like that. We still had VHS tapes. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he, he was there. He, he'd seen it all. And he used to tell me these stories that he'll tell you in the coming episodes. And they used to absolutely fascinate me. And I'd go, OK, I'm going to look into that. And that's what made me fall in the rabbit hole and get to where I am now. And I've seen it, like we mentioned, with J-Mac. He's starting to, I'm starting to see myself in J-Mac because he's going, Yeah. wait, are you, are you trying to tell me that Martin <laughs> Giannetti did, did, did what to Shawn Michaels? <laughs> yeah. It's like, aye, he did, he did. It's more, it's not so much what happens in the ring, it's all the interesting shit behind it. Yeah. If you're already into wrestling, you know because you've done it yourself. But Kevin's a guy who lived through it. He was there way before I was, and he's half the reason why I'm here today speaking about wrestling. He's a guy who got me into this uh, rabbit hole. And that's so. a, it's, a very, it's a very universal rabbit hole. We all kind of collectively are one big consciousness. Same as you guys listening. <laughs> we are the WWE and the AEW universe. Universe, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, so I'll quickly just briefly touch on what happened this very day back Ooh. in two, uh, 1997. 97, 23 years ago. Wow. Yes. On this day, Goldberg got smashed. <laughs> his, uh, <laughs> his streak ended by uh, Kevin Nash and uh, Scott Hall, who tasered him with a, was it a cattle prod or something like that. Aye, and he's still not bad about it at all. Like, <laughs> he's so <And> that, salty. <laughs> they, they they mark that as being the 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 moment that WCW, you know, the final nail in the WCW coffin. Yeah, so I thought I'd just kind of pop up on that. But you know, I think on, on our next couple of episodes, we'll kind of dive into a little bit more about what happened on the day that we record, maybe 10, 15 years ago, and kind of just bring up a little bit of bits and bobs. But before we run out of time, we're going to go through our top five. Um, our top five wrestling moments. For me, when Todd had kind of says, let's do our top five. And I suppose yeah. it's good for you guys to kind of hear that, to kind of judge who we are as wrestling fans, okay? Um, I'll, I'll kick off mine with, uh, with with my number. So we'll go five being the lowest and not one being the, the highest. Do you, right? do you want to do it like you do five, then I do my five, and then you do four? And then I think maybe four. if I just go, here's my number five, and then your number five. Yeah, okay, right? yeah. Sure. Um, so my, my number five would have to be um, Hogan versus Warrior, that match oh, nice. um, back in 1990, which was WrestleMania 6. And the reason that was that for me is because that's the very first match I ever watched ever that, that started this whole craze on wrestling. So that happened in 1990. So I wasn't even born, right? <laughs> So I must have had that around 96 or something because I went into an old place called Flemings. You could find in Inverkeith in Scotland. And I think it still exists. And it's a place where you buy like furniture and whatnot. And I walked in and I recognised Hulk Hogan like everybody else has said <laughs> because Vince McMahon is a, a genius when it comes to marketing. I recognised Hulk Hogan from a TV show that I watched regularly called Thunder and Paradise. <laughs> right? Well, that's Hulk Hogan. Right? That's the guy that lifts cars. So I was like, Mum, please. And who was this other crazy motherfucker <laughs> on the front? So I took that VHS home and I watched it like mad. And I could only watch it in the living room. So there's only one VHS at the time. This must have been about 96, right? And I watched it over and over again. And I remember just constantly being annoyed that Hogan didn't win, right? But then I was like, it's all right, though. <laughs> it's all right, because they made up after it. Because look, they're hugging, right? But every time I would rewatch the VHS, I'd be like, come on, Hogan. <laughs> stupid, stupid. It's like, I'd still, he did it again. <laughs> I'd still try and root for him, even though I knew, right? And and it kind of left a better taste, like, oh, why did Warrior win? Right? <laughs> Looking up the law of averages. <laughs> He's got to win one of these days. <laughs> one he? of these days. But he totally didn't. He always got beat. Uh, and and I, I always seen that, you know, Warrior had the Intercontinental title, right? But now he's got two titles. And I thought, God... I just thought, as cool as Warrior is, I didn't want Warrior to win. I wanted Hulk Hogan to win because he was my guy. And from that moment, that's when wrestling became a thing for me. So that was it. And I was was marking it. I was a mark. (laughs) It's a a wee, like, three, four, five-year-old mark. I'm a mark. Uh, they, they, they got me hook, line and sinker, man. I was like, fucking, I need to watch the next one now. 
<laughs> awesome. Um, I, I feel like I'm going to be, uh, you, your, your moments are going to be like the highs of the highs. When, when I put my list together, I'll be honest, um, I totally cocked up. I thought we were doing the f- top five moments of 2020. Um, I can run through them very quickly at the end, but uh, for the top five moments of all time, I thought, oh, it's really difficult. Um, but I don't want to just click off that highlights because I think I could say things like, uh, you know, the hell and cell, which you might talk upon. I don't know. I don't, I don't know Kevin's list. We don't know it either, Lich, so far. But I thought, but okay, go for the moments that I enjoyed, my f- moments that maybe other people wouldn't ha- know so much about. Um, and for number five, I was between two. Um, I almost went for the Dudley Boys return when they returned in 2012, 2013 against the New Day because that was the late after Mania and it was incredible and it still is a fantastic return, like one of the best returns in mm-hmm. recent memory. But for me, I had to stick true and it's never return, and it was return of Shane O'Mac um, when he returned. Um, and I think it was because at that time, I mean, about that period, um, I'd got into wrestling quite a bit, and I'd done my homework, and I said to Kevin, I was like, you know who's not been around for a long fucking time who would fucking blow up a place if he came back? It was two people, really. But one of them, one of them was Kurt Angle. The other one was Shane McMahon. And people probably think, Shane McMahon, he wasn't a top guy or anything like that. But I tell you what, he was respected by the people who watched during that era. And he watched him. He was around and played a pivotal part in the most golden era of wrestling. And people don't forget that shit. And it proved when he came back out of nowhere, the crowd went fucking mental. Mm -hmm. It was like like a five-minute standing ovation. And uh, he got a This Is Awesome chant just for showing up. And you can see Vince, he's very proud and almost teary. And Shane McMahon is a bit teary, kind of breaks character a little bit. It's one of the best returns um, and most underrated returns, Mm -hmm. in my opinion. And he's been back ever since. And I know people, some people have kind of got go away heat with Shane McMahon. I personally don't. I love the guy. Whenever I see him, for me, I'm like, he's a guy who would make me tune into WWE no matter what he's doing. Mm. So that was number five on my top moments because um, Shane McMahon's awesome. Hell yeah, I've got to agree with that. Uh, number four for me would have to be not just the 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 debut of Kane, but the actual Hell in a Cell match with Shawn Michaels and oh, The Undertaker. Mate, I, again, VHS. I used to re-watch that and re-watch that. And, I, and you know what? I was happy Such Shawn Michaels match. won. At that age, I was really, I was rooting for Shawn Michaels <laughs> to win. Right? Do you know why? Because he spent most of his most of that match getting fucking leathered. Oh man! To the point where the fact that see that just that two guys trying to win. Who'd have thought that that'd be lost in wrestling? Right? Two guys just trying to win. Taker knew he had the upper hand. Right? It was it was his. You know the, the hell in a cell was Sean's going nowhere. Right? This little bitch is going to get his comeuppance, and yeah. he. He beat the shit out of Shawn Michaels to the point where it took his brother. It's gotta be, it's gotta be Kane. (laughs) It it took a monster ripping the door off, right, using his own move against him, right. And the best of it was, it was simply just uh, the arm over to win the match. Yeah, just fucking poor. It's like he wasn't even aware of it. No, You, you know, you know what the beauty of that match is, right? Hell in a Cell. For most people, say that's Undertaker's match. That is Undertaker's match. But um, he lost the first ever Hell in a Cell. Uh, but the reason why that's his match is because Shawn Michaels took such, such a fucking beating in that match <laughs> that there was no other way that if you watched it, it goes, I got beat, but <laughs> you still wouldn't believe anybody else beating him in that match exactly. <laughs> unless shit exactly. went like that went down. Exactly. Um, so that that is one of the best matches of all time. Um, if anybody doesn't know already, I'm like the biggest Shawn Michaels mark in the world and that leads me to my number four yet again another probably underrated moment but for me it's my favorite promo of all time especially heel promo it was Shawn michaels 2005 promo in montreal uh, during his feud with hulk hogan and um, of course this was the second run that sean had after he came back from his bank injury after mm-hmm. 1997 Montreal, and I believe this was his first appearance back in Montreal since then. I'm getting goosebumps just thinking of it. He comes out dressed in a suit with a pink tie, by the way. <laughs> a pink tie is a beauty Bret Hart. And then comes out with the line, Who's your daddy, Montreal? <laughs> then proceeds 
to sing the Canadian anthem. <laughs> oh, Canada, I hate this place so much. It sounds really <laughs> juvenile, but you can see him smiling with the heat that he's getting. He begins to strip in the ring. He even gets Bret Hart, the biggest pop that Bret Hart ever got, despite him not even being there. <laughs> oh, I love Bret Hart. I think he's a fantastic wrestler. But it's I can't do it justice. If you have not seen it before, do yourself a favour. Go and watch Shawn Michaels' 2005 promo Montreal and watch um, an absolute lesson in heel promo and just absolute pure heat heat and hatred from an audience is and if anybody tells me Shawn Michaels was never great in the mic I point to that promo and go fuck you Shawn Michaels was one of the best on the mic man <laughs> go and check it out no um, I won't see much more than that I can't do it justice um, uh, another for me so my, my third one again featuring Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker was their match at Mania 25 oh man uh, probably the best match ever one of the, it's up there when you talk about top five greatest matches ever was there. Um, not only for the match, for the story, for the conclusion of the story, for you know it all kind of coming full circle. That was almost the end of, of everything that kind of happened in the actual era. But you and I actually spent our time those couple of years cooped up watching these matches, rooting for our own guy. And for me, that was just as special as the actual matches. The memories of like not having a house to run and kids to look after and just being teenagers and loving wrestling. For me, that, again, that stands out for one of those reasons. We um, streamed out on my old laptop and we kept cutting out the stream. We come back <laughs> and who was on top and who was winning. <laughs> not only so that, but you were so convinced uh, Michaels was going to win. This is back when people actually believed the streak could be broken. And uh, we'd proper, this would be like, what, three in the morning or whatever, because we're in the UK. So the pay-per-views are obviously later here in the UK and uh, and your mum used to bang through just like that old family guy's get <laughs> keep it down keep it down <laughs> if I gotta come through and tell you two again <laughs> and that's us sure. that's us marking it at false finishes <laughs> that was great that's that's it's my, still my favourite match to this day I think it's a match that you can show to anybody and say I think it's like the entry level match I think if you say to somebody who's never watched wrestling say if you can't get into this match or like it then you never yeah. will yeah that's in my opinion so i feel that's one that j-mac should should watch um that's definitely one there's there's lots i mean it's not just like that's the only one there's thousands thankfully but that is definitely up there mm-hmm. um for my number three um i've chosen another match maybe not as um good uh, a match but certainly just as much a spectacle maybe even more of a spectacle uh, Rock Hogan. Um, mm. uh, yeah, this match didn't even go in last. It's not a great wrestling match, but what I love about it is uh, everybody knows they've seen it. The crowd are just, the crowd almost like make up 50% of this match. Mm-hmm. And Rock and Hogan just totally playing it. What I really love about it is that it's, it's like almost like a time capsule in time because The Rock now is like one of the most popular wrestlers of the time. But at the time, he was still the wrestler and Hogan was the uh, mm-hmm. nostalgia wrestler he was the one that they all wanted to go over and it's quite clear with the hardcore fans they are all Hogan the mm-hmm. Rock's almost playing like a John Cena type role in this yeah and, and to see Hogan uh, the only only thing would have made it better is if Hogan was in the red and yellow instead of the NWO stuff but I think that's maybe the point it was like a it was like a double uh, maybe not a double turn but certainly a, a face turn for Hogan that night yeah they, but they, they certainly the audience dictated what they wanted and yes and Hogan and The Rock, uh, like like any proper wrestler, they reacted and responded to what the audience. So that for, how can you not say that that's a perfect match? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's another one of those. If you've never, if, if you've never, if you listen to this podcast, and never seen it, I don't know what you're doing. But um, if not, go and watch it now. It's on the network. It's on. It should be online as well if you can find it. Mm-hmm. Um, honestly, it's about twenty five minutes, and it's twenty five of the best minutes you'll see of, of a live sports type. Uh, arena but certainly wrestling matches some spectacle yeah so. for sure my number two <clears throat> and and bear in mind I, i'm judging these by just purely based on how it affected me to the wrestling product how yes. it, i had to have, if you can make me feel something you're doing you're doing good right especially through wrestling when matt hardy come running through the audience and started proper laying into edge Oh, After man. we all knew what had gone down in real life, right? 
I was like, fucking what? Because this really blurred the lines between reality and fiction, right? Yeah. Still you, does. <laughs> right, still does. We, and we all know what kind of went down between them. Um, Edge had cheated. Edge and uh, Lita had an affair behind Matt's back. And then Matt got fired because he, he spoke out about it. Obviously, he was upset. Uh, so everybody had this feeling already that Matt had been screwed. And then what what really got me, and I think this is, if it was all, if it was all, and again, that the, the fact that we're sitting here saying, if it was all kind of faked, right? What really got me, as you can tell, when the security are pulling someone off in a work, right? A pull apart as a work. And you can tell when they're not. And the one thing that got me was the intensity. Matt Hardy jumped the railing and started attacking Edge, right? And the security were on him like that, right? To the point where they were holding his hair and everything. And he, he just was, ah. And I know a lot of it was a work, right? But there was, they'd done it so well. They'd done it so well that you were sitting there going, fucking let him go, let him go, right? That for me was like, wow. And, and then I'd be so looking forward to an Edge match because I knew it's like, He's going to come out there, right? And he would, he'd just fucking jump out of nowhere. And everybody with the crowd, you'd hear the crowd before you'd see Matt because people in the crowd would see Matt ready to jump the barrier, right? So you would hear, you'd see Edge, you'd hear the crowd, right? And then you would see Matt. And I'm like, fucking, <laughs> that was fucking electrifying to watch. And I thought, it's, fucking yes. Some people might not like me for this comment, but it's the most over Matt Hardy ever was and ever will be. You know what? I think it was. I don't know. The broken Matt Hardy done... It was over, but um, I think he, that was his most over period. At that if point. only they'd run with it properly rather than having him get his heat kicked in. It, it, it also legitimised Edge as a star, to be honest, because I mean yeah. Edge has always been good, but I think that after that, he just went up another level and then he got into the Undertaker stuff and the rest is history. Yeah, um, well, I, th- I think um, it go down as the the start of Edge's rise. Yeah. He, he kind of did take off after that. My number two is definitely uh, it's definitely one that was um, not one I watched live at the time. It's one of these ones that when I was digging back in, I feel is a massive hidden gem. And maybe people will say, that's not a hidden gem, but for me it is. Um, you might have watched it live at the time. You'll certainly know what was going on at the time because it was the time you were watching. It was Backlash 2000. And uh, to set the premise regarding it, Austin had just broken his neck and had been out for five months. Um and this was at the point where the authority reigned <laughs> the WWE, which was Triple H and Stephanie McMahon. The um, McMahon-Helmsley uh, era. Yes, the McMahon-Helmsley era. They had the title. Everybody couldn't fucking stand them. They were doing a grand job at being the top heels. Um, and, of, and this was the point where Vince and Shane were also in. And uh, their victim of choice at that time was the, most, the second most over person other than Austin at the time, which was The Rock. And in Backlash 2000, the main event of Backlash 2000, The Rock challenged Triple H for the WWF title of Shane McMahon as the uh, referee. And Vince McMahon side, you know, aside, there was no chance he could win it. And uh, also Steve Austin was also supposed to be a gauntlet enforcer. But before the match, Vince comes out and says, he's not in the building tonight. He's no coming. Get it up, he's. Uh, and they then proceeded to battle seven colours of shite at The Rock for about 20 minutes. The Rock looked like he was about to make a comeback, but then he would get fucked over by the referee, Shane McMahon not counting for him, that type of stuff. And you know where it's going, um, but still, when it happens, nothing quite prepares you for the obscene reaction when that glass shatters. Mm -hmm. And then Steve Austin comes out in his frigging camouflage gear and... (laughs) Just stomp a mud hole and walk it dry. <laughs> yeah. Cheers to Patterson. Cheers to Briscoe. Cheers to McMahon. Stunners all round. <laughs> rock Rock then does his finish. Wins the title. The place is going bananas. If you've never seen the main event at Backlash 2000, I implore you, stop this video, go to it, come back and say thank you, Todd. That was fucking awesome because it is. Yeah. That's my number two. And it is so overlooked. Yeah. Um, Sure. I don't know how you feel, Kev, if that brings back any memories. Or... Of course, mate, of course. Um, I was there for Austin's, you know, his, his full rise to then watch him kind of fizzle away in 2002, 2003. Um, yeah. So it was it was a magical time. The Austin era, uh, I mean, that was, the, the, the Attitude era was Austin and McMahon. Yeah, you know it what really I mean? was. And, uh, it really was. You know, I think 
Austin's hit that stratosphere now, like like The Rock, like Hogan, where no matter what, the minute you hear the glass shatter, it'll always be the same reaction. And it'll be the same this Monday night. Well, <laughs> it probably won't be because the no, crowd will be likely. <laughs> the speed of glass shattered and followed by. <sighs> oh, that sucks, man. So uh, here, here we go. Number one for me. Um, so I'm going to paint Ooh, the picture. Here. So what happened uh, was, so Undertaker had a match with Vince McMahon, a buried alive match, right? Oh, uh, I know this is called. Kane came out and ended the match. He put Taker to rest. And a whole year went by without seeing Taker one time, right? And then the then the the dirt sheets start to report. We think Taker's coming back. We think he's gonna be, you know, Taker of old before the American badass. And I was like, nah, no way, but that would be fucking cool, man. That would be fucking cool. So it was to a point where I was like, he's not coming back, right? The tease, the absolute tease towards WrestleMania where Taker's coming for Kane and then middle of the Royal Rumble the lights go out you hear the dun, the fucking ring starts shaking right there's smoke everywhere lightning and he's like no no the complete the fact they managed to tease this match with no Taker right but just lighting effects right and Kane, Kane's reaction and then the, the moment where Kane's standing in the ring at WrestleMania 20 and the lights go out and then all you hear is I was like, fucking here we go, mate. <laughs> here we go. Right? The druids are all out. They're holding up the 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 fucking the sticks with flames on it. I was like, right. That moment for me was like fucking that was just it was that's what that's why I watched wrestling. Now, just to hear Paul Bearer, because Paul Bearer hadn't been seen on TV for a long yeah. time. I mean you had yeah. Taker, but Be- Paul Bearer was long gone. So to just hear Paul Bearer, you were like, holy shit, it was like Luke Skywalker coming back in the Mandalorian. Yeah, right. it's it's absolutely the best equivalent of that. Yeah. It's also from a time where the internet isn't what it is now, mm-hmm. and it wasn't spoiled. Um, it was it was just teased enough to go. We think this is happening. We hope this is happening, but you never had it ruined. Going, that's going to happen. By the way, yeah, it was just hope, pure hope. And then, as you say, with that, I, I wish I could have experienced it at the time because I can completely understand how an Undertaker Mark like yourself must have mm-hmm. felt that point and let's be honest in my opinion from that point onwards he goes on the bet people might argue me here but i feel that he does his best work from there onwards Mm. Um, a lot of it was a lot of his but i mean i think you can you can take his best from previous and his best from that moment and you've got yourself the best it's certainly not a criticism of that um the american badass era because actually he did a lot of really good stuff Mm. during then um as I say, I wasn't. I didn't watch a lot of it at the time. But going back, people seem to, you know, it's not an error. It's focused on as much, at least anymore, at least from WWE standpoint. But mm. it's certainly an, an error where he did a lot of good work, and he should be celebrated for that as well. Yeah. But he certainly has had his dicks up quite a lot recently by WWE. So mm. anyway, <laughs> deservedly so. <laughs> my no- and it leads me to my number one, which um, also includes the Undertaker. Now, I was in two minds because. Um, my first instinct was to put the end of the era, Hell of Cell, WrestleMania 28, because um, of the whole Triple H, Shawn Michaels, three of my favourite wrestlers at the time, just kind of coming together. But then I thought about that and I was like, nah, it doesn't really tie in with the Undertaker character. I don't like him being kind of like, I'll be your pal, I'll be your buddy. I liked him kind of being like, I'm, I'm digging holes, taking souls, fuck you type thing. Mm-hmm. So it's a good moment, but for me... Even though it's one that make a lot of lists, um, it goes down as number one because it's the most shocking, the one we never thought would ever happen. I can still remember what our reactions were like at the time. It's WrestleMania 30. It's not a good match, but my word, when it comes to moments, nothing nothing from here to the day I will die, in regards to wrestling, will make me react the way that that WrestleMania 30 when Brock Rosner beat Undertaker for the streak. Mm-hmm. Nothing will... Mm-hmm. Um, we create that feeling. We were, oh, look, another F5. All right, okay. We and you were actually quite bored by that point. Like, I take her, just fucking pin him and get it done with. And then when it happened, it was, yeah. <laughs> and the reaction of the crowd, you see, I don't know. You cannot manufacture that. No, they will never be able to capture that light in the bottle again. 
And, and when people say, oh, it shouldn't have been broken, I'm like, no, because that reaction they got there, they will never get again from anything else. Um, the audience just kind of stood still, eh? They're like, oh. Yeah. It's, it, for me, it's like the ultimate, like, I think it helps because to me, I, I, I was invested in a streak by this point. We went through, the streak was never really a thing, but see, when it began to become a thing, it became like the most important thing on Mania to me, or the most intriguing at least, because I'm like, see this year, were they actually there? Were, were they actually there? Mm -hmm. See, after Michaels didn't do it, yeah, Triple, Triple H, H came in and I thought, right, if they're going to do it now, this will be the time to do it. And after 28, I got the, I was like, right, okay, they're never going to do this then. Um, so I was like, that's it. They're never going to be Undertaker at WrestleMania. It's done with CM Punk. When CM Punk faced them, I was like, doesn't matter. You're not beating them. This is the whole thing. Nobody's going to beat Undertaker. They'll all come close. It's like, you'll chase a dragon. It's like, you get, you just get a bit closer every time, but you never actually catch him. But then Brock Lesnar fucking caught him <laughs> and fucking pinned him. <laughs> and, uh, we all kind of lost our minds. Um, yeah. I remember the rest of that show. It was a great WrestleMania that year. But... Was. They managed to. They even managed to pick us up after that. <sighs> Daniel Bryan. But it was such a lot. I think it was like two or three matches in between that event and the main event. I can't even. I can't even remember what they were. Um, that's Divas how... match followed the Undertaker, <laughs> <laughs> and actually, this was before the woman actually really took it serious. I remember that because you you remember saying you reading it something on Twitter like we've sent the divas out for sacrifice but yeah see the other matches in that paper I can't remember I think it was like Batista and John Cena or something like that but honestly we were we were, we were like shocked we were like somebody died it was about I, I imagine the, the probably the closest thing and it's going to sound quite morbid is probably when Owen Hart uh, over the edge mm. that, that feeling of just like what have we just seen? Um, mm, kind of. Remember the fans not that he was dead, eh? I, I, I know, I know. I'm, I, see, I don't want to compare something that was scripted in a work to some something that actually happened for real and a man actually passed away, but mm -hmm. I'm just trying to compare, um, you know, how we felt, like, how, how like, what the actual fuck? Yeah. Um, and I can't, I, I cannot write or predict any, scenario in wrestling where they'll be able to do anything like that again um and the streak was its own thing as well i mean even I, the fact that he got beat and the streak still carried some legitimacy afterwards speaks um, yeah of how how um the legitimacy of the undertaker so exactly anyway that was my top five just very very briefly i did do a top five for 2020 i'll just very briefly bang that off uh Number five, Dinner de Noir, which I alluded to earlier. Fucking loved it. Musicals in wrestling. It was like something that had to happen at some point, and I was glad I was alive to see it. Um, four, McIntyre's Run the Champ. Uh, Roman Heel turn number three. Mm. Uh, Taker Boneyard match and the Last Ride documentary series as all yes. rock and roll. And the n number one for me was the Royal Rumble match, which I felt was the best Royal Rumble match they've done in Absolute Donkeys with the yeah. Return of Edge. Uh, McIntyre eliminating Lesnar and just Brock Lesnar, man. Brock Lesnar deserves so much credit for that Rumble match. He was, mm -hmm. it was like a Rumble match of old, you know. Um, so that was my top five for 2020. So absolutely, I don't have a top five for 2020, so I will put mine on next. Next, <laughs> okay, cool. Um, but yeah, that's been a, an absolute blast doing this. Um, so if you guys have enjoyed, please hit the subscribe button, follow us on uh, YouTube and wherever else you hear this. Uh, you can find Jibber Podcast everywhere. Make sure to check out the next uh, Jibber Podcast again, which is the deep dive of... Sleepless in Seattle. Sleepless in Seattle. God, I almost... I don't, why did I... <laughs> you I was, hated it that much, you couldn't remember the name. <laughs> exactly. <Spoiler. laughs> yeah, no, no. But definitely go and check that out and check out everything, everything Jibber Jabber Podcast. You can find us at jibberjabberpodcast.com. You can find everything there. You can support us in every which way there. Um, I have been Kevin Wells as always and Todd you have been yeah, Todd and I have been me <laughs> <laughs> so I look forward to bringing you more wrestling content every single week uh, Todd where can everyone follow you uh, they can't well you can if you want but you won't read much <laughs> <laughs> so yeah definitely check us out on uh, Facebook Twitter whatever and wherever else just, just follow Jabber Jabber that's fine <laughs> <Thanks again. laughs> see you guys class